the Friday Juma prayers following the easing of restrictions. In business tonight, patronage of domestic flights increases from 136 <coughs> passengers to 236 passengers in four trips in a day, a month after resumption of operations. And on the international front, Washington, D.C. Mayor changes name of a plaza outside the White House to Black Lives Matter Plaza in a rebuke to President Donald Trump. Well, live on TV3 Ghana on Facebook, DSTV channel 279, all across the world on 3news.com. This is your election command center and we first begin from parliament where there was confusion in the house on Friday over the report of the subsidiary legislation committee on the constitutional instrument of the electoral commission. The decision of the ranking member for the subsidiary legislation committee, Yao Bwabia Samwa, to edit the final report of the committee on CI-126 today generated heated debate. I am bound by the chairman's current stance, which was not so an hour ago. Barely an hour ago, that was not the position. Barely an hour ago, the position was that he was meeting the exigencies of the House. We had spoken on the phone, and he was sending his final correction ahead by the electronic means so that we could prepare for the motion to be taken in the House. Subject to agreement between majority leader and minority leader, whether it be taken today or Tuesday. This generated intense debate on the floor as the House patiently awaited the chairman of the committee, Dr. Dominic Aine, to present the report after it was laid on the floor on Thursday. The subsidiary legislation committee, one of the only two chaired by the minority, voted on partisan lines to approve the controversial CI. Chairman of the committee, Dr. Dominic Aine, was emphatic. He handed the final report to his ranking member, Yao Bwabinga Samoa, to peruse before presenting it to the plenary. The Honorable Majority Leader says that what was done yesterday is a nullity. Mr. Speaker, it cannot be a nullity by reason of what he has said. The report was laid yesterday and, and it has never been redrawn. So you have to redraw it by a motion. You can you you have to no. I have you redrawn. I have you redrawn. I have you redrawn the report as late. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I'm sure you are very much being yourself an experienced parliamentarian. You are aware of what has been happening in this house. So the vice chairman laid it before this house. The report is before this house. The report is from a legal technical point of view before this house. And so it is not, I mean, it doesn't lie in the mouth of the, the majority leader now to say that it's a nullity. What was done was a nullity, Mr. Speaker. The development resulted in the postponement of debate and approval of the CI seeking to give the Electoral Commission power to compile a new voters' register. The constitutional instrument has up to Tuesday to fully mature. Both the chairman and ranking were at each other's throat. The development generated heated exchanges which brought in the majority and minority leadership. There have not been any time where ranking determines how a committee formula will be. To the extent that you can take the chairman's report and change even its format. You only state your comment and then the chairman will look at it. If it's not controversial, he introduces it. If it's controversial, he calls the whole committee for them to agree. So, Mr. Speaker, I just want to state that our habit of every now and then want to stand down orders. Our standing orders make sure that when business are late, we have 48 hours for it to mature. It is to enable all other things to be done before. But when they are very urgent, then we will then say, let's shorten the period. And now we've turned the 
abnormal situation as the new normal. Every business want to shorten the period. Mr. Speaker, they are supposed to be summoned, but we must also res uh, respect what they are doing now, especially given the, the current Honorable members. The debate has been postponed to next week Tuesday, where the report is moved on which day the CI matures. Well, some MPP delegates in the Offenso South constituency have threatened mayhem in the upcoming parliamentary primaries should the party leadership allow one person to go unopposed. The delegates say they are ready to support any of the aspirants who emerge as victorious, but will resist any attempt to impose a parliamentary candidate on them. Here's a report by Ibrahim Abubakar. The NPP delegates and some party sympathizers marched from Offenso Township to the Offenso River where they slaughtered a ram and performed some rituals to warn leadership of the party against imposing a parliamentary candidate on them. The aggrieved group were up in arms against an alleged decision by a section of the party's leadership to allow the incumbent MP, Ben Abdullah, go unopposed in the upcoming parliamentary primaries. According to the group, the new patriotic party's democratic tenet should be upheld in ensuring qualified parliamentary aspirants contest the polls. All that we want from them is peace. The community are yearning. They are crying. All that they want is election to take place for them to get their peace and justice. So we are pleading to the national level that they should allow peace to prevail in offense. The group wants the president to intervene to prevent any disturbance within the Nshaisu constituency. The three of them, the candidates, they have all passed through Verton. So we don't know the reason why we are hearing that our national leaders are saying that we shouldn't uh, vote, but they will let our MP go unopposed. If that comes, it means they are imposing him on us. But MPP, we believe in democracy. So we are saying that they should allow for primaries so that the uh, delegates choose the best candidate for offense. Efforts to speak to the constituency leadership of the party on the development have not been successful. Meanwhile, some delegates and supporters of the NPP in the Jobin constituency are protesting what they claim to be attempts by the party's leadership to create unfair contest in the parliamentary primary. Benjamin Edo reports. <laughs> Three persons picked nomination forms and filed to contest the job in NPP primaries scheduled for June 20. They are Francis Osui Chow, a mining consultant, Alexander Kwesiopong Poku, a businessman, and Amapoma, the incumbent MP. But few days to the primary, some delegates claim the leadership of the party is scheming for the MP to contest unopposed. They are resisting the move with the invocation of cases on leaders who consent to disqualify other aspirants. The over 100 delegates performed the rituals at Nobewam on River Isuo Abena. <laughs> Delegates allege some national executives of the party are influencing some delegates to append their signatures for the incumbent MP to go unopposed. From Nana to Dan down to Asante region, we are urging all our executives. We trust in them. So they should do what to help with the constituency executives so that we will be okay. We only need elections. 
And we know that our Honorable MP, Honorable Amapama, doesn't fear competition. So they should give us a uh, competition so that we all will be okay with the decision that the party wants to take. Any party in Penny for say, so I'm a per se, MPP, say election way, you lose your seat in the Ayas and opposition, the Ayas, no Amo, Gabin constituency, Omayan to Abano, and Nibreso, Omayan to Abano. See, right there, there's a lot of and he's there in the Ashanti region NPP. Let's just stay a bit further in that region. And the only female aspirant in the NPP Quad Aso constituency race, that's Josephine Hildado, has refuted claims she's been disqualified from contesting the June 20 primary. The party's third vice chair, Frederick Fedua Anto, told a local radio station the former MP for Quad Aso was disqualified on grounds of bad character. But Hildado says... Evervanto only expressed his views as a supporter of one of the other aspirants. He spoke exclusively to TV3's William Evansenkum. Are you still in, in the race? I'm still in the race. I've been campaigning. This morning we had the third vice chairman of the party and also a member of the vetting committee say that you have been disqualified on grounds of bad character. <laughs> I think I'm a decent woman. I'm not of a bad character. And he was asked whether he was communicating on behalf of our party. He said no. There was this meeting after the appeal and the whole thing was not conclusive. So my point is, why did he come out anyway to put it out there if they haven't concluded? Why he's doing that he will have to answer that question. But I know, you know, from since 203, this man has been having a problem with me because um, he was um, backing somebody when I was coming the first time when I won. I don't know what's behind that. But simply that's how I can put it. I don't know anything beyond that. Okay? He came out too early. If a party is taking a decision and you are claiming that it's inconclusive, why do you come out to put it out there? I'm also on air. Okay, so I think um, he didn't do well coming out that way. I don't think the party is taking that decision. I don't believe it. I'm inclined to believe that is coming from Mr. F. F. Anton. I don't want my party to be dragged into it. It's coming from Mr. F. F. Now let, let's look at the issue of bad character. And what is your party's position on that? What is bad character in the first place? Can you please explain that to me? Uh, since that was attributed to you, because it could mean a, a lot of things. I mean, yeah. being disrespectful and all of that. Thank you. I don't know what somebody, Mr. F. F. Found to me, call disrespectful. With all respect to him, I'm not dealing with my husband. Okay. I'm a woman who has been able to lead a constituency. I was a member of Pan-African Parliament. I'm only assertive. I try to speak my mind by not insulting. And away from the NPP primaries, civil society organizations in the Upper East region are calling on the Electoral Commission to suspend the compilation of the new register till all citizens get their Ghana cards. The CSO contained 501,702 eligible voters would be disenfranchised should the exercise take place. The spokesperson for the CSOs, Bismarck Ayorogu, made this known at a news conference in Bogatanga. In the Upper East region, a total of 220,000 people were registered for the Ghana card, of which only 13,200, representing just 6%, had their cards issued to them. You can just imagine the frustration and stressful conditions under which the 220,000 of us went through to register for the card, just for a small percentage of only 6% issued with the card so far. He said not all potential voters have Ghana cards or passports. Bismarck Ayurugu called on the EC to suspend the exercise and law eligible voters get Ghana cards or passports. We strongly urge 
the EC, who is managing the electoral affairs of this country under the governance of a listening government to demonstrate more responsiveness and accountability to the Ghanaian people by giving a listening ear to our concerns. In your election command center here, across media general platforms, our government has begun rolling out the second phase of its evacuation program for Ghanaians stranded abroad due to the coronavirus pandemic. The Foreign Affairs Ministry has arranged chartered flights to bring back Ghanaians based on a schedule drawn by the ministry. Responding to questions in Parliament, the minister indicated that a lot of considerations have gone into government's evacuation program. To ensure a well-coordinated evacuation exercise, government decided to undertake the exercise in phases. This decision was informed by financial and logistical considerations namely the capacity of our isolation centers to hold large numbers of evacuees, as well as the human resource capacity of the National COVID-19 Task Force. The countries captured in the schedule include Nigeria, Mauritania, Ethiopia, China, United States of America, the United Kingdom, the United Arab Emirates, amongst others. The minister also said negotiations are currently underway between our Beijing mission and Ethiopian airlines for the evacuation of staff 675 stranded Ghanaians in China. Similarly, our mission in Abu Dhabi and consulate in Dubai have initiated discussions with the UAE authorities for the evacuation of over 500 of our nationals who are stranded in that country. Ghanaian nationals who are stranded outside the country and willing to bear the cost of their evacuation were earlier asked to submit their details to their Ghana High Commissions by close of Wednesday, May 13, 2020. Let's go to the Ashanti region where some Muslims in Kumasi today observed the Juma prayers for the first time in 12 weeks. Leadership of Muslim communities took steps to ensure all outlined safety guidelines were duly observed to prevent the spread of COVID-19. A report by Ibrahim Abubakar. The COVID-19 pandemic compelled government to place a ban on social and religious gatherings as part of measures to contain the spread of the virus. After 12 weeks, government has lifted the ban, but with some limitations. Mocks and churches have been asked to ensure they meet all safety guidelines before opening for congregants. At the Kumasi Central Mocks on Friday, there was a high level of compliance for the safety protocols. Veronica buckets and hand sanitizers were placed at the entrance of the mocks. Worshippers had their temperature and contact details taken. Congregants were numbered to ensure they did not exceed 100. An ambulance was stationed at the premises of the mocks for any eventuality. Congregants also adhered to the safety protocols of wearing face masks and carrying their personal prayer mats to the mosque. We met all the leaders of the Islamic uh, divide on Wednesday, that was third, and we all agreed that we are going to ensure that all the regulations are going to be followed religiously. So, uh, we are going to do it continually until we are sure that Corona is no more and until maybe the president comes again with a different re regulations. Because when he says, sir, Juma prays, I am a mosque. I even say, now what you be a dunu, and I say, do not know. You are to me, I'm a salawa. As in name is Oman Pin, Abekasa, Ashe, Shabisia, Yandiso, Mobaha, Moon say, social distancing Yadiso. Maybe I'm a pain catcher and Yadiso. So, if you lie, I did as I don't know. Lie about could be a fun per day hundred, but in the social distancing tea, you find part ten. Some of the worshippers were satisfied with the safety measures at the mosque. Juma prayer is one prayer that is so important in Islam. 
for us uh, to observe, especially when there is a pandemic. This is the only place we can come and pray for the nation and for the world to end it for Almighty Allah to end the pandemic. So in as much I feel I passed through so many restrictions, I also feel relieved. Meanwhile, the Ahmadiyya Muslim sect has directed its members to continue observing prayers at home. The Muslim leadership is urging the public to continue abiding by the safety protocols to contain the spread of the virus. It was a northern region where the Shia Muslim community in the Tamale metropolis also observed the Juma prayers following the easing of restrictions by President Kofuado. Congregants numbering over 90 were at the Al Hubei Mosque to pray. It was 12.15 p.m. and the Azan had made the first call to alert members that it was time to start heading to the mosque. One by one, they made their way to the mosque located at Kublimagu in the metropolis. One is greeted at the entrance with inspection of face masks before entry. Veronica buckets, soap and water were available for congregants to wash their hands. Personal information and contact details of congregants coming in to pray were taken. At quarter past 1 p.m., the mosque was filled with members. Before offering their prayers, the Shia Imam of Tamale, Sheikh Dalhu Abdul Mumin, appealed to members to ensure strict adherence of the safety protocols even in their homes. Sheikh Dalhu, before commencing the Juma prayers, condemned the gruesome murder of George Floyd, which has resulted in civil unrest in America. The illegal criminal killing of an America by African American by name George Floyd. It is illegal, it's criminal, and we condemn it. We need to protect lives and be honest to ourselves. Human beings must be seen as equal and the same everywhere. Some congregants who were at the mosque and observed the prayers shared their views. It's for our own good. They are doing all those things are there for our own good. I can even see their writing our names. Maybe if they say they can trace us. I think that's the right thing to do. Meanwhile, the Al Bashir Mosque in Tamale also observed the Juma prayers. However, Afajura, Ahmadiyya, Al Suna, and Ambariya Mosque did not observe the prayers. Update you on the case count. Some 283 additional cases have been recorded over the 24 hour period, pushing the number of that's the case count, total case count, to 9,000. 168 from 8,885. So that's the new confirmed total case count. That's inclusive of both the recoveries and the death cases as well, as 9,168. Now, the recoveries have also gone up to 3,457. That's 3,457. So some 268 additional recovery cases have also uh, been recorded that some good news to look at. But there's also really, really worrying news there. Some four additional death cases also recorded within a 24-hour period, increasing the number of death cases to 42 from the initial 38. So now the death cases, total death cases, stands at 42. The active cases is 5,669. That's if you subtract the recoveries, this, and also the death cases, from the total case of 9,000, you get this 5,669. There's the active cases. We also got into the issues with critical cases and severe cases as well, just so you know. But this is how the original breakdown looks like. The Gisra Akra region still over 6,205 now. The Ashanti region now 1,518. And the Western region increased from 456 to 519. The Central region 452. Eastern region 162. The Volta region previously had 86 cases, also increased to 102. And that also same with the OT region. But look at this. The critical cases, there are about three people on ventilators now. Uh, University of Ghana Medical Center has six of those critical cases. Uh, that are the severe cases. The East, four. Kolebo, three. 37 Hospital, three. Konfanoche, two. And Ridge Hospital also has two of those severe cases. So that's how the picture really looks like. We're keeping an eye on how this 
uh, world resort and as we keep saying let's all do our bit to adhere to the safety protocols because each of these represents Ghanaian lives and we can do our best to reduce the numbers stay with us we'll be back shortly after this quick break in more news tonight, President Kufuado says government will continue to provide evidence-based infrastructure development across the country as it is critical to promoting growth and enhancing key sectors of the economy. The president made this known while commissioning phase one of the $56 million Tema Motorway Interchange project. The newly constructed Tema Motorway Interchange is a five-legged runabout serving the residents of the Tema main port of the country, the Volta, Eastern, North and Upper East regions as well as neighbours in Burkina Faso and the entire Abidjan Lagos corridor. The 56 million US dollar Japanese government grant project is part of the Ghana International Corridors project. And God willing, the second phase which will complete this project to make it one composite project will begin in the fourth quarter before the close of this year. This will be the final phase of the transformation of the two-tier interchange which we are commissioning today into a three-tier interchange. This will involve the construction of another tier on the north-south direction to lift the Tema Akosombo and two traffic on a dual carriage over the current upgrade intercession. President Ikufuado said government will continue to provide evidence-based infrastructure to enhance growth and economic development. We made a pledge to the Ghanaian people to expand and improve the road network while closing the missing links in the network. We had to make this pledge because we know that the so-called unprecedented infrastructure development of the Mahama administration was fantasy, existing in the Green Book and not on the ground. We know that the provision of quality road infrastructure is an important tool for the socio-economic development of our country and government will ensure the even spread of such projects across the country. The president charged the citizenry to use the facility responsibly. We as Ghanaians need to be mindful of our responsibilities in the use of our roads. Although the necessary safeguards have been put in place, the severity and frequency of accidents on our highways due to overspeeding and indiscipline are a great reproach to all of us. Motorists must be extra careful and disciplined on the highways and resist the temptation of overspeeding. Mesha CT Engineers International Company Limited Supervising Consultant and Mesha Shimizu Dai Nippon JVE executed the project. <laughs> Business News is up next. The Business News segment is brought to you by MTN 4G Plus, Universal Merchant Bank. A very good evening to you. Thanks for staying with us on News 360. Time for business. My name is Nana Ikuya Mensa Brampa. Beginning from aviation, domestic flights in the country has increased from 136 passengers to 236 in four trips in a day, a month after the resumption of the operations, though the number is significantly less compared to the 2,000 passengers on same number of trips before the COVID-19 pandemic. Deputy Minister of Aviation Yao Afo believes it is impressive and he spoke exclusively to TV3. On March 23, all borders, land, sea and air were closed per a directive by the president to help contain the spread of the coronavirus in the country. The new travel restrictions resulted in no demand for commercial flights. 
the aviation sector which was hardly hit by the pandemic is estimated to have lost over 70 percent of its revenue generation prior to covid 19 2000 passengers were flown on four trips in a day for domestic flights and 7000 passengers for international flights since the resumption of activities of domestic flights on may 1 barely 240 passengers fly when they started on first may our they did four trips to kumasi and the passenger throughput that day was uh, 136 passengers. And as of uh, yesterday, they did 236 passengers. So in that sense, I can say that uh, we have made some improvement. According to the deputy minister, there hasn't been any challenge so far enforcing the adherence to safety protocols. Everybody knows how deadly this disease is. And uh, we all want to leave, so we have not had any complaints as far as that is concerned. I believe even if we get a vaccine for this disease, these particular protocols should stay with us. He was, however, uncertain when full operation of flights will resume. Not until we get a vaccine, it's going to be very, very difficult to predict. But we hope that... Uh, at some point in time, maybe we cannot rebound f fully, but the same way we have st we started the, the domestic oper operations, once the European Union and the Americas start opening their borders, I believe um, we will see some rebound, but not fully. The downward economic projections put most jobs at significant risk, including workers in the aviation industry. But the deputy minister guaranteed there will be no job losses. Over here, not a single person has lost his or her job because the president has directed that he doesn't want to see anybody lose his or her job. So we are making sure that not a single soul loses his or her job. All right, let's move away from aviation now. And the director of business operations at Dalex Finance and leasing company, Joe Jackson, has observed it will take between one to three years for business activities in Ghana to bounce back to pre-COVID levels. He attributed this to a decline demand and called on industry to look at creating demand locally to speed up the recovery process. Economic activity is not like a tap where you can just turn it on and turn it off. There's definitely a lag. That effect will take some time to restore. In all this, people have safety concerns. Currently, what is happening, we are not sure of the future. Because you can't do any um, projections. You could see that their capital has bent. They don't really have any money to um, resuscitate themselves now. Director of Business Operations at Dilex Finance, Joe Jackson, noted the slowdown in the country's export and imports is a challenge to overcome. It could take up to one to two years for us to see economic activity start to pick up to the levels they were pre-COVID-19. And that would even require that we are adjusting and retooling and repurposing our businesses to take care of the new normal that is COVID-19. Hmm, I've heard estimates as bad as three years. As businesses start looking internally, how do we create demand and, and, and uh, appeal to the internal markets that we have. Greater Accra Regional Secretary of Ghana Union of Traders Association, Guta, Nanapoku, agreed. This is an opportunity for government to revamp the local industries. Because all the things that we've been um, importing out there can be done here. But you could see that the local industries also lack capacity to produce. It's about time government built capacity with the local industries. It shouldn't be like mouth talk. But what are the implications of a slow pace and long period towards recovery? Government revenues are no, going to be nowhere near they were before. Allow the government to borrow. Let's throw away the budget 
and the fiscal constraints. Each company look within itself and say, how do I repurpose my business? How do I retool my business? How do I maybe even change my business model? And producers of Cowbell Ghana's leading powdered milk have commissioned a community borehole facility for residents at Domiabra in the Brim North District of the Eastern Region. 20 of such projects would be constructed in selected communities across the country. Residents of Domiabra in the Brim North District are predominantly farmers. Previously, the over 400 residents of the area resorted to using untreated water from a stream in their community or harvested rainwater. But the situation has changed. Promacido, producers of Cowbell, Ghana's leading powdered milk brand, has provided a community borehole for them. We are grateful to Cowbell for providing water for the community. Yes, sir. And then the three days, in so toy and ayesa, and to be and so beton. Anytime it rains, water from the stream gets polluted. We have to trek several kilometers to get water. This situation makes children late to school. Nasa Kobasa, the school from Kada, especially an neighbor. The Brim North District Chief Executive Raymond Anadamti commended Promacido, producers of Cowbell, for augmenting government's efforts in providing water to the five communities in the area. The chiefs and people of Domiabra are grateful to Promacido, producers of Cowbell, for this initiative. We really appreciate their efforts. They are also embarking on a number of projects in the area. The commercial director of Promacido Ghana Limited said the company aims at providing good nutrition for its consumers, hence the provision of water to the private communities to reduce waterborne diseases as well as help fight COVID-19. The main objectives of this project is first of all to ensure the access to water, clean, safe drinking water, and also to reduce the impact of unavailability of water uh, on uh, children's uh, education. He explained the project also marks World Milk Day and the 20th anniversary celebration of the Cowbell brand in the country. And throughout the week, the city has depreciated marginally against its major trading currencies. Today, on the interbank market, it depreciated against the pound and the euro and was unchanged to the dollar. You can visit 3news.com to get all the figures there. That's it for business. My name is Nane Kriya Mensah. Hello, good evening and welcome to the sports segment here on News 360 with me, Juliet Bewa. Now, as the sports sector continues to reel from the coronavirus pandemic, there is underlying or undenying the fact that the impact it has had is huge. And Nanekuya Amankwakwe looks at the corresponding effect on women's football in Ghana. Yes, Navalia. The global pandemic of 19 continues to have its adverse effect on football in general, and Ghana is no exception. Here at Kolegono Beach is goalkeeper Patricia Mante of Immigration's Ladies and Black Queens doing her personal training to keep fit, hoping for the return of the Women's Premier League. Major clubs are looking at billions in losses if the season isn't completed, but virologists and sports medics see a risk in resumption of games amid this pandemic. I think it's normal because uh, anything can happen anytime. Or if something like this comes, you have to uh, cope and do your best at the right time. Oh, we are doing our best at home. As we are sitting home, we are also training and we are doing our best to prepare for other uh, seasons. Milot Pokwa who is one of the top scorers in Hazaka's ladies and also a black princess's striker, shared her sentiment. This sickness has taken away many things from us because we don't play football. It's not easy um, being a footballer and then you face a big challenge like this. This COVID-19 has spoiled everything. 
Football is a sport which monetizes differently across the globe. In Ghana, the female football clubs are now being kept on their toes after going through successful branding that helped in attracting more spectators to the games. People were looking forward to the second round. So on that score, it's a bit disappointing that we could not continue with where we were. Um, the ascendancy with which the, the, the league and the awareness creation was going where the women's uh, league foot, uh, Premier League was concerned. Now, moving away from that, and former Ghana under-20 wonder kid Ebenezer Esifwa has completed a move to second-tier French side um, Pool Football Club. And um, the former FCCN attacker has spent the last three seasons in France at Le Havre FC following an impressive spell in Switzerland. And the deal comes after the expiration of his contract in which he featured only six times in the League Two this season. The 26-year-old will wear the number 18 jersey and becomes the club's first signing for next season. Remember, Esifa was a key member of the Ghana squad at the 2013 FIFA Under-20 World Cup tournament in Turkey. And he finished the tournament as the leading goal scorer with six goals. So that's all for sports here on News 360 with me, Juliet Bill. Have a great weekend. On entertainment, the music industry has been severely impacted by COVID-19, with many concert tours, music festivals and other events cancelled or postponed. Della Michelle puts the spotlight on the Jazz Kings Band, which has been bearing the brunt of the pandemic. The Mind Established by legendary George Darkon, known as the King Beggar High Life, the Jazz Kings Band is now led by George Chrissy Darkon Jr. The group of 10 has been in existence for over 10 years, performing on the local and international scene. But it's been almost three months now since the Jazz Kings Band graced any platform to treat their clients to good music. Their last performance was cut abruptly when President Ekufado announced a lockdown in the country due to the outbreak of the coronavirus. George Kwesi Dakun Jr., leader of the band, recounts that fateful day. We were on stage when the president announced that there wouldn't be any social gathering. Actually, it, it affected the whole band or the music industry. We're having a gig. There were so many lineup of gigs before the announcement came in. And so those that had booked us called us that we have to wait till the ban is over. And yet, we're still in it. It hasn't been easy. The group had to refund money to a client who had earlier made payments for their services. There was a program we were to do at El Cropon. And uh, it was there when uh, the announcement came. And so immediately the announcement came, the client called me that, George, the program is no more coming on. And it's a, it was a 100 years birthday. They had made a payment of 1,000 cities. And so um, the family says we should return it. And I said, OK, this one is it's nature. There's nothing we can do. Prior to the COVID-19 outbreak, the group rehearsed three times a week. But now, their best option is to do so via WhatsApp. For Ken Pobi, administrator of the group, he had just decided to quit his regular job to become a full-time musician when the pandemic broke. Even if we were able to save something, <laughs> as at now or by now, what we saved wouldn't be enough to maybe carry on for the next month or so, you know. So uh, it's been a worry. It's been a worry. And then we don't know when everything will be over. Benjamin Okine, lead vocalist of the group, says he misses the stage and his audience. For him, music is all he knows and loves. Oh, I miss it so much. It, you love me singing and you see me on stage. When you are sleeping or you are sitting, you get up and dance because I'll engage you. And I've missed my stage. In the president's recent televised address, the ban on social gathering was partially lifted. Private burials can now have a capacity of 100. But the group says it will not be in a haste to regroup. Normally we look it at 
you being a, a, a someone employing a band or, or getting a band to play in your function, you, you sometimes consider the uh, uh, the number of people who will be there. So definitely you have a change of mind. Oh, it's just hundred of hundred people. So why do I have to even involve the band? They have vowed not to inflate their service charges when normalcy returns. We're not going to go higher because as it is there, we're going to go like that. When I say that, I mean that um, if it's about, let's say, 100 people, and we should go by what will suit the client because now there's nothing to go by. Till then, they will keep hope alive and prepare for a comeback. Well, that's it for the news this evening. I want to say thank you so much for staying with us throughout the week. It's going to be a great weekend. Watch out. On behalf of the rest of the team, thank you as always for staying with us. I am Alfred Bukansi. And I am Portia Gabo. Enjoy the rest of our programs. Good evening.